And welcome back to another Cannabis Thought Leader podcast series. This is Abe Cohn with THC Legal Group. Today we have Morgan with us. Morgan, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Great. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, how are you involved in, in the industry? Um, I know you're primarily working on, on the policy side and the advocacy side. Um, you know, tell, tell us about yourself. Let us get to know you. Uh, well, I've uh, been uh, working in the communications department of the Marijuana Policy Project for uh, the last eight years or so. Uh, we're the nation's largest marijuana policy reform organization uh, dedicated to uh, making sure that marijuana becomes regulated like alcohol and that people who need it for medical reasons have safe and reliable access. Um, primarily, my day-to-day work is just uh, talking to reporters and making sure that uh, this issue is framed appropriately in the media and that people uh, hear our side of the story. Uh, it's you know becoming much more uh, busy lately uh, now that more and more states are considering these sort of laws. Interesting. Okay, so does your organization um, focus only on marijuana or as an extension of your advocacy, are you interested in normalizing and perhaps legalizing other drugs as well? Uh, no, we're entirely based on marijuana policy. Ah, I see. You know, that's not to say that there aren't good arguments in favor of uh, regulating all drugs similar to alcohol, but uh, MPP is solely focused on marijuana policy. I see. Okay, so and and what does it mean to advocate for uh, marijuana legalization? You know, on a, on a very mechanical level, does that mean you're um, working with congressmen? Are you? Um, working with local community leaders, what does it mean? What does advocacy in, the, in this space mean? Uh, well, MPP is dedicated primarily to changing laws. So, uh, at the state level, we're involved in uh, legislative lobbying uh, as well as running ballot initiatives in states that have that ability. Uh, MPP was actually uh, the primary supporter of uh, three of the four successful ballot initiatives to legalize marijuana uh, for adults this past November. Uh, and we've been involved in a number of the other successful uh, state-level ballot initiatives in the past, including in Colorado and in uh, Alaska. Um, so uh, at the state level, that uh, takes up the, mo- the majority of our work. We also work at the federal level to try to uh, uh, be able to pass legislation that will re- either remove marijuana from the uh, schedule of controlled substances and have it treated similarly to alcohol by an organization like the ATF, uh, or at the very least, incremental approaches to uh, removing federal oversight to marijuana and protecting state legal marijuana businesses. Interesting. Okay, you know, one, one of the more contentious um, points of the Trump administration, <laughs> amongst many, of course, um, was his appointment of Jeff Sessions. What, what do you think that appointment means for the cannabis industry? There have been reports that Jeff has um, been not only not in favor of cannabis, but perhaps even actively anti it. I'm just curious as to whether or not you think Jeff's appointment um, will, will mean something truly onerous for the cannabis community or, or whether or not many of these fears are, are just unfounded. Well, he's certainly no friend of marijuana, that's for sure. Uh, however, uh, the Attorney General serves at the pleasure of the President. And, uh, you know, Say what you will about uh, President-elect Trump, uh, the man's not necessarily stupid. And when you look at the level of polling that we have in favor of making marijuana legal and regulated like alcohol, I mean, uh, just this past October, we had uh, Gallup showed a 60% support, Pew Research showed 57% support. Uh, You know, we're clearly in an area here where we have so much support for changing these policies that uh, becoming like draconian and backlashing against them, I think, would be a tremendous political misstep. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, while Sessions may desire to do that, uh, his boss is going to tell him no. Uh, at least uh, that's my read on the situation. You know, uh, anything could happen, and advocates have to be prepared for uh, restrictions in the industry, but I think that it's an issue that uh, has so much support that it would be a waste of time for the administration to start uh, moving backwards on. Uh-huh. Well, you know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with this development, but a couple of weeks ago, the DEA um, specifically included CBD as one of the substances that it was pushing underneath the Schedule One Controlled Substance Act. Um, th- did you find that disturbing, also, or is CBD not immediately under your purview? What did you guys think about that? 
Oh, well, that ruling actually has zero practical effect for anybody involved in marijuana. CBD was Schedule One drug before that ruling, and it continues to be a Schedule One drug now. So there's actually no real change in that. That ruling was simply a way to for them to change their reporting uh, for international uh, statistical data. Uh, currently, under uh, uh, UN practices, uh, marijuana extracts are listed in a very specific category. So the DEA just changed their reporting uh, category so that they could more easily give data to the UN. That's all that did. I know that there are a lot of people that were freaking out about yeah. it, but there, there was absolutely no practical change whatsoever. CBD was Schedule 1 before, it's Schedule 1 now. Okay, that's very interesting, and I think important for some of our listeners who are interested in getting involved in, in the industry. Um, you know, we, we briefly spoke about this a couple of minutes ago, but I think one thing that, that people find confusing um, is just what a, a, quote, legalized marijuana looks like on a, on a legislative level. So what are the different options um, from a bureaucratic point of view in terms of actually legalizing it. So would it, would it mean that the Supreme Court would come down with a ruling saying that the DEA's scheduling is unconstitutional? Would it be on the congressional level where where um, Congress would, would say marijuana is now legal, perhaps under uh, a substantive due process argument under the 14th Amendment? I mean, how would it become legal? Who would be doing that legalization and kind of how would all of that work? Well, so even if Congress decides to make marijuana legal tomorrow, it's still illegal in, uh, you know, 42 states. Uh -huh. So uh, you would have to actually go through and change state law. Now, just because marijuana is legal or is illegal federally doesn't mean that states can't make it legal. Um, they just can't interfere with the enforcement of federal law. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's basically how this balance has worked so far. Um uh, in order for marijuana to be legal completely and without uh, states having to worry about federal interference, it is going to take an act of Congress. They're going to have to change the Controlled Substances Act so that marijuana is no longer included in that schedule and that it's controlled by an organization like the ATF. Um, you know, there are probably a lot of fixes that can happen at the federal level before that actually happens, such as, uh, you know, deprioritizing, uh, you know, spending uh, appropriations uh, measures that make it impossible for the DEA to spend money going after state legal marijuana businesses, which has already occurred, but which will be expiring in April. Uh -huh. um, you know, just uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, different ways that you can approach this issue, but we're not going to have a true fix where states can implement the policies that work best for them without any fear of federal influence until we uh, make marijuana legal at the federal level. And that requires an act of Congress. Uh -huh. Okay, so would, would, it, would it be fair to say that your organization would have you know, succeeded, whatever that term mean, means, once Congress does in fact um, make those changes? Absolutely not. Uh, Absolutely. There are going to be a lot of... Uh, states that are going to be slow adopters, and there's going to be plenty of work to be done in those states. Uh, I mean, if you look at alcohol prohibition, there were states that uh, still didn't allow the sale of liquor within their borders up until the 80s. Uh -huh. And I think that we're going to have probably somewhat of a similar situation with uh, cannabis. Um, there's going to be plenty of work to be done to ensure that state systems are not overly onerous, that they protect businesses and they protect consumers, and that uh, people have the ability to use this substance that is safer than alcohol without fear of arrest. Um, yeah, and there might be some holdouts in a lot of areas of the country, so we're going to be hard at work making sure that we're enacting sensible policies in those states as well, despite the fact that you know it might take a little bit longer. Well, you know, de depending on who you ask and the, the sort of activists that you speak to in the community, you'll find very different reasons for um, th their support. Why do you think cannabis legalization is so important? Um, are, are you coming at it from a constitutional point of view that perhaps it's an, it's an individual liberty right? Or do you think that it's important because of its health benefits? Do you, What is your particular impetus for... Um, supporting its its legalization and, and of course the organization that you work for what what is the, the driving principle um, that that pushes forward the agenda uh, well for myself personally and you know probably for the organization as well I could just say all of the above uh -huh. uh, but I personally uh, you know I saw firsthand the effects of the government's war on marijuana and how 
people had their lives ruined for using a substance that's safer than alcohol. And there was absolutely no reason for these sort of punitive uh, 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 consequences for this particular behavior. And as I started learning more about it, I started learning about all the other implications of uh, marijuana prohibition. You know, the uh, uh, incredibly racially disparate way in which it's enforced. Uh-huh. Uh, the fact that it's, you know, propping up a criminal industry that doesn't even need to exist. Uh, the fact that it, you know, robs people of the ability to get, uh, you know, fair housing or to be able to get an education and puts them uh, under basically a lifelong uh, uh, spotlight for any sort of behavior whatsoever. And I think that, uh, you know, after seeing a lot of these, uh, these things play out and seeing what a huge effect they have on, uh, you know, American culture and on criminal justice, it's something that absolutely needs to change. So, you know, here we are in 2017, where do you think we are just kind of taking a step back and looking at the, the lifeline of, of marijuana? Where does an American stand in 2017? 17, who, who enjoys cannabis and is concerned about um, prosecution by the law, you know, are we moving closer and closer towards full legalization? How long do you think it will take? You know, what, what does the landscape of legalization look like in your mind? I don't like to make any solid predictions about timelines just because I don't want to be, you know, that provably wrong. Uh-huh. <laughs> <Okay>. But uh, <laughs> we won't hold you to it. <laughs> uh, when, uh, when you really look at it, I think that, uh, you know, we're in a better position than we've ever been. You know, there are eight states as well as the District of Columbia where uh, adults can possess and consume cannabis without fear of arrest. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think that that's a huge step in the right direction. Uh, we've still got a lot of work to do. And like uh, with any social justice movement, the, the pendulum swings both ways. And, you know, we may find ourselves in a position where there are going to be some uphill battles ahead. But we've got more public support than we ever have. Uh, you know, the, like uh, Gallup polls have been looking at the issue for the last, uh, you know, since the 60s, and it's been going incrementally up and up and up, and it hasn't dropped at all. So I think that we're just generally, as a culture, moving in this direction. Uh, plus, we're getting much more information out of the states that have made marijuana legal, and it shows that, you know, regulation can work. It's a far superior system to uh, criminalizing otherwise responsible and law-abiding adults and criminalizing an industry that could be run by legitimate tax-paying businesses as opposed to criminals. Uh-huh. Very interesting. You know, one, one of the things that um, advocates like, like to do is point to the success stories of other countries and, and look to how, certainly in European countries, you know, how they have gone about framing their own um, legalization programs. Do you, are, are there any countries that, that come to mind that you think have done a particularly good job normalizing cannabis, regulating it, legalizing it, and kind of just bringing it, bringing it into the fold of normal society? Well, I think that the Dutch were very good at making cannabis boring. Uh-huh. And I think that that kind of contributed a lot to uh, you know their, the fact that they have very, very low teen use rates. Uh, people that you know, are uh, like they have much lower rates of uh, like problem cannabis users. Uh, and they have the uh, systems in place to deal with people that might consider themselves to have drug problems related to cannabis. Uh, But in terms of actual legal policy, I think the United States still wins across the board. We have the most uh, uh, supportive laws for businesses that can, you know, really bring this product above board Uh uh, and, you know, do as much as any business can to push out the, uh, the illicit market. Uh, I think that you know the uh, laws here are actually much more uh, inclusive and comprehensive, uh, whether they be medical laws or legalization laws or even just decriminalization laws, than anything that we see anywhere else in the world. Um, you know, Uruguay has a very interesting system set up that is state-run, and uh, I think that like we have yet to see an example of that in the United States. I think that it's probably going to be coming soon, uh, sort of along the lines of how some states have. Uh, state-run liquor stores, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, where they don't really necessarily allow private businesses to be involved in it, and all the stores are completely run by the state. I think that we're probably going to see some experiments along those lines with cannabis in the coming years. Um, I'm not sure if that's a preferable situation or not, uh, but as it stands right now, I think that the situation that is going on in the United States is uh, superior to anywhere else in the world. Interesting. At least in the legal states. Mm-hmm. Okay, one, one thing that, that I found particularly interesting about what you just said is that the Dutch have done a good job making it, quote, boring. What, what, what did you mean by that? 
Uh, well, I mean, socially, uh, marijuana is not considered to have the, uh, the same sort of like, uh, like rebellious cachet that it does in the United States. Uh-huh. Uh, you're actually starting to see that now among uh, like youth opinion polls that while uh, young people are recognizing that marijuana is safer than alcohol and their perception of risk about it is going down, uh, their use rates aren't going up the way that drug warriors had said it was going to for years when that uh, realization came to be made. And I think that that's because it's now uh, not necessarily seen as something to be associated with rebellion. It's something that's just associated with medicine or associated with just like anything else, uh, like an a agricultural commodity. And therefore, it takes away a lot of the, uh, the incentive for young people to experiment with it and to, uh, you know, uh, to use it frequently. Uh-huh. Okay. So, you know, just kind of gradually bringing it um, into the norm, you know, making it more socially acceptable will, will hopefully um, – kind of mitigate some of the risk of legalizing it, at least some of the risks that people have, which, which is the abuse of cannabis. I think that's a very good point. Absolutely. Um, and when we remove the stigma, we, uh, we get people that are in a position to be actually be able to change policy, uh, no longer being afraid to tackle the issue. And we also have the added benefit of not making it enticing to uh, the youth. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we're, we're moving towards the end of this discussion what do you think people should do who want to get involved, who, who recognize just how draconian many of these laws are and, and, and want to do something about it? How, how can a regular person get involved and in, in kind of work either with you guys or at least um, in pursuant of, of the same goals and objectives? Well, if you go to mpp.org, you'll be able to find ways to uh, stay updated on any sort of changes in state law that are going on in your particular state, as well as federal law or any really state you're interested in. Uh, But I think the number one thing that you have to do is talk to your lawmakers. Traditionally, there has been a huge lag between public support for marijuana policy reform and where lawmakers are in terms of their support publicly. So if they hear from their constituents over and over and over again, that we need to change these policies, they're going to start to listen. Uh, and there are a lot of ways on the MPP website that will direct you uh, to be able to uh, contact your lawmakers uh, uh, directly through that system. Wonderful. So just you know, get involved, make your voice um, known to, to, to public officials, certainly to lawmakers in your immediate area, and and just kind of keep pushing along. And hopefully, we will we will see real reformation in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. And lawmakers, are they depend on constituent uh, uh, information. So hit them up on Twitter, uh, talk to them on Facebook, uh, go to their offices. It's very easy to be a lobbyist. You can just have to walk in the door. Excellent advice. Okay, well, but before we, we let you go, Morgan, I was just hoping you could give, you know, a, a departing message or thought or, or something to our listeners. You know, what what is it that you want the listeners to know about you or your organization or about this movement. Um, you know, what, what is an important thing to, to keep in mind as we end this conversation? Well, considering the uh, target demographic of your show as being people that are involved in the cannabis industry, I think it's very important to stress that, you know, these industries would not exist without the work of nonprofit advocacy organizations. Mm -hmm. And currently MPP and similar groups receive less than 10% of our funding from industry organizations that only exist because of the work that we do. So if you're involved in the industry, please make it a part of your line item budget to give back to these groups that are making your business possible. Okay. Excellent. You know, the industry only survives with the help and mutual support of everyone involved and all of the different wings of the movement. Um, Morgan, this was a real pleasure to have you on. I certainly learned a lot, um, and I'd love to have you on in the future. Uh, Anytime. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, this was another Cannabis Thought Leaders podcast. My name is Abe Cohn with THC Legal Group. Until next time.